Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kenzie Pulsifer from the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Welcome to our September Friday Forum. Today's webinar will look at reducing the risk of extreme wind damage and using computational modeling to enhance community resiliency. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to remind everyone that you can ask questions at any time during the presentation by typing into the Q&A box on your screen, and we will save all of the questions for after the presentation. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Gurma Bitswamlak. Dr. Bitswamlak is Associate Professor and Canada Research Chair in Wind Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering, Director at the Boundary Layer Wind Tunnel Lab and the Windy Research Institute, as well as the SharkNet Site Leader at Western University. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Bitswamlak. Okay, thank you, Kenzie, for the kind introduction. Uh, good, up, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, reducing the risk of extreme wind-induced damage, primarily through uh, more accurate and community-based uh, computational modeling. The agenda for today include uh, introduction to Wind Engineering 101, particularly explaining the wind load chain that Alan Davenport developed a while ago, uh, then I will introduce you the different wind engineering tool we have to assess uh, the wind risk on the built environment. Uh, but today I will be more specifically focused on computational approaches that are useful for community-wide uh, risk assessment. And I have brought two examples, one focus on hurricane impact assessment, both on individual building and group of buildings or neighborhoods, and the other is a tornado impact assessment, and it, it brings uh, the Don Robin tornado. As we all remember, last year, tornado touched down in our capital, and one of the community near Ottawa that was hit hard is Don Robin, and we'll see our uh, tornado simulation for that uh, community. We, we are aware that uh, the climate stressors are becoming more frequent and stronger perhaps. Uh, as you can see from the following image, on the left top part, you have the Joplin tornado damaging the entire community. And you have also on the bottom uh, left, the Hurricane Michael damage on uh, Mexico Beach in Florida, uh, particularly the house, the White House that you see in the front. Uh, it, is, uh, it is designed for a wind speed perhaps twice larger than what was uh, expected, and it kind of survived the hurricane. And there was a lot of talk about it, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, if a community is not resilient and your neighbors, the schools, the roads, the hospitals are not intact, one single house doesn't save the community. And as far as I see, it's a, a damaged uh, community. So we have to focus more on community resiliency just to enhance uh, the function of a community. Uh, there are other forms of climate stressors. Uh, the heat wave looks like more recurring. Uh, the good example is the 2004-05 uh, Paris heat wave that claimed thousands of life. And last year, uh, during summer, 40 people died because of heat wave in Montreal. Uh, during the same time, there were a number of casualties in Japan, Tokyo, and the flooding in our major cities is a reoccurring re process. Uh, in September 2018, uh, as I mentioned earlier, tornado touched down uh, near Ottawa uh, in the Ottawa Gatineau region. And the picture you see on the screen is a Don Robin community. It was before the damage on the top left corner and after the damage on the right top corner. And on the bottom, you see a house completely devastated by uh, the tornado. And uh, last year alone, the uh, insurance industry in Canada uh, covered a $1 billion uh, claim. Uh, and uh, Dan Robin, uh, Gatineau, uh, Nippon area damage is estimated at $300 million according to ICLR. 
because of this and other historical reason, there is a strong wind research presence at University of Western Ontario, thanks to Alan Davenport, who is a pioneer in wind engineering research. And Western is a home to critical mass of highly experienced wind engineers, technicians, researchers, and a number of state-of-the-art experimental facilities, like the first powered layer wind tunnel that is used for civil infrastructure and a dedicated high performance. Uh, we have also what is uh, equivalent to a structural uh, reaction uh, lab, reaction frame lab, uh, what we call like the insurance, uh, sorry, the three little peak. Uh, and most recently, we developed the windy EDOM. Of course, it is 2012, now it's becoming an old facility. And uh, this facilities and the supercomputing that's available to us so our own cluster and SharkNet, and there was also a South Ontario smart computing platform that really encouraged a computational research has been a blessing to win research at Western. And we can attribute to the success to this gentleman, Alan Davenport. Uh, the genius of Alan Davenport is his, uh, in addition to understanding this complex processes, he has his own way of communicating it to engineers, architects, policymakers, in the most simplistic way, you know. One of uh, uh, the examples that exemplify the simplicity is the wind load chain, you know. If you are interested to uh, understand or assess the impact of any uh, microclimate impact on a particular building or community, you have to go through different steps. You know? First, you have to know the wind climate. Uh, first element in the load chain. Uh, it could be, you could be studying hurricane, then what is the frequency of the hurricane? What's the wind speed, the maximum wind speed near the ground and things like that, you know? What's the statistics over uh, the period? Then wind, uh, unlike other stressors, it's affected by whatever it sees, you know? The exposure, upwind exposure, whether it is urban, suburban development affects the wind in a different manner, you know, like if you have mountain valley system, it affects the wind, you know, you have to model that, which is categorized by the second uh, chain, influence of terrain. Then when it comes to the steady building itself, the aerodynamics in layman's term, the shape of the building uh, affects the wind load itself. Perhaps it is one of the stresses, it is not only affected by the geo-environmental parameter, but it is also affected by the shape of the building that you are studying. You know? uh, for low-rise building, a hip roof uh, produces a different wind loading compared to a gable roof. For tall building, a rectangular cross-section building has totally different loading from a circular or a triangular or for that matter, a rectangular. You know? Then you have to model all this. Uh, the turbulence uh, in uh, nature has frequencies ranging from zero to one hertz, you know. Then most of our structures like tall building, traffic signs, transmission line, electric uh, uh, cables and things like that, they have natural frequencies that could be excited by this frequency. Then uh, this dynamic effect has to be modeled as well. And you apply these steps again and again for whatever uh, design criteria you have. It could be a wind evaluation at a building level, at a component level or at a community level. In fact, to give you more explicit examples to associate it with each of the steps, traditionally we use a boundary layer wind tunnel to assess uh, the aerodynamic effects. I started from the middle of the chain because that's perhaps one of the most important. And the way we do it is uh, we go to the airport and uh, collect uh, 50, 30, 100 years of uh, data, whatever is available in the nearest airport. And we study the wind speed, the wind directionality, and this drives the load, you know, the intensity of the load, the response is affected by the wind strength that is blowing in that region. And statistically, we represent this. Uh, the wind rose example that show, uh, that's given here uh, indicates exactly that. Then we go into, uh, for example, if you are in downtown to Toronto and you want to build a new uh, tall building shown by the red, you know, then you have to study all the upwind in all the 36 uh, compass directions 
and examine the roughness and their impact on the incoming wind field. You know? In the wind tunnel, the way we do it, uh, if you see the top wind tunnel uh, picture, uh, the ground roughness and the spires do take care of uh, the far upwind uh, obstructions. But close to the study building, we reproduce every building tediously uh, in addition to the study building. And this, uh, the green is the turntable, it rotates uh, as we test uh, for wind to represent the wind direction. And in this manner, both the aerodynamics or the shape effect of the building, the surrounding effect and the upwind effect will be captured. If you have uh, some flexible uh, structures, for example, although not very clear, at the top of the study building, the uh, plexiglass building that you see on the top wind tunnel picture, there's a, a tall antenna. And that antenna is so flexible, we cannot test it only by replicating the shape. We have to replicate a dynamic effect by way of reproducing uh, the flexibility or the dynamic characteristic of the structure. And I'm going to run a video here. It, you would see how the antenna fluxes, rotates, and uh, vibrates under the action of the wind. You know, this is similar to how uh, the flexible structures flex and moves under the action of the wind, and we have to reproduce this. So this is how uh, we do it uh, through the traditional uh, test. Uh, most of the examples I discussed thus far are for straight wind, but wind could be tornadic or downburst. And luckily at Western, again, we have the wind E, which is cap uh, capable of producing tornadic flow. The video I'm showing at the moment and downburst flow. I promise this is the only uh, noisy video I have. I intentionally include it just to make you alert in case uh, you are following me. Oh, sorry. So, uh, but my focus will be on computational approach. You know, what, why are we focusing on computational wind engineering? When you look at the frequency of natural hazards, you know, we keep hearing more and more tornado damage, hurricane damage, flood damage in, in what looks like a higher frequency than uh, before, most likely aggravated by climate change. You know? uh, then when you have this, what we, what we might not traditionally study with wind tunnel testing and things like that, particularly the low rise structure, uh, we may need to pay attention and investigate them and design them in an engineered way to mitigate the hazard. So uh, there should be a cost-effective way of not only looking at the component, but the building at neighborhood scale as well. And a multi-scale nature of uh, the problem uh, guides us towards computational research. And most of the wind-induced damage are not only induced by wind, you know, it could be wind-driven damage, Wind, sorry, wind-driven rain damage, it could be wind-borne debris damage, it could be wind-driven snow and things like that. So there's a metaphysics nature, at times difficult to do it experimentally, but can be uh, conveniently done uh, computationally through high fidelity uh, numerical models. Uh, unfortunately, we deal with the most chaotic lower atmospheric boundary layer flow, turbulence, you know? As a structural engineer, if you want to design a building, there's no shortcut, you have to estimate the peak load. The peak load depends on how well you model the turbulence. There's no shortcut. And usually the boundary layer turbulence structures, they, they cover wide range of temporal and spatial range. Uh, difficult both to be created in the lab environment uh, or computationally. And you have to deal with this. And one thing uh, positive uh, is the, the growth of computational uh, power, you know, more and more computational resources, particularly in South Ontario are becoming available thanks to SharkNet, the SOSIP uh, effort, IBM and things like that. And parallel with the uh, algorithm development, there are really high fidelity open source CFD tools that we can 
weak them to be useful for wind engineering. One such tool is OpenFOAM that we use regularly in our research team. And there is also a more uh, need for accurate and timely wind induced loss prediction. You know? Like majority of the time, the loss prediction are made based on claim data related to the stressor wind. You know? uh, the middle steps like the aerodynamics, uh, the upwind schemes and things like that, they will play more role, uh, but they are not explicitly model. And sometimes uh, this approach, although fast, very useful, may not also uh, encourage mitigation, uh, aerodynamic mitigation, structural mitigation, because the resolution is not there. So if we develop high fidelity computational uh, models, maybe it will assist in uh, timely and more accurate high resolution loss prediction models. And since, since uh, we started working in computational wind engineering, uh, we have been uh, addressing majority of the wind load chains and uh, develop uh, computational models for each of them. There are a group of researchers who work on the climate model, like global circulation. Usually my work doesn't reach there, but I collaborate with Professor Art Legil and from the private industry. But the influence of the terrain, aerodynamic effect, dynamic effect, uh, we are trying to capture them uh, through computational research. This uh, video that I'm playing now at the top, the blue color, shows uh, the wind flow uh, in uh, downtown Miami. Uh, uh, the one at the right with a dark color, that is uh, the wind flow, how it can flow over a uh, community in uh, Florida. I will be uh, discussing about this uh, community in more detail. And even we have started combining the structural and the fluid dynamic model and start to produce uh, aeroelastic effects. You know, this is what I was trying to describe So the antenna earlier, you know, you can see the vortex shedding on the sides, uh, moving the building sideways and the drag forward, and you have the cyclic looking motion, you know. And the influence of the terrain can be estimated from uh, LiDAR information collected either by airborne or in the future, perhaps uh, through uh, drones and other uh, low range remote sensing applications. Going forward, uh, I will uh, introduce the work that we have been doing uh, on Hurricane. It includes uh, validation of CFD models with wind tunnel uh, data. And I will bring an example of a residential community modeling. And we have also looked into uh, what we call uh, progressive uh, damage aerodynamics. And uh, we use these models to model uh, wind driven rain ingression into a residential building. I must say, because of the chaotic nature of uh, the flow that we have to deal with, unfortunately, uh, there is a turbulence associated with this and with it. And modeling turbulence is not trivial. You know? Majority of the time, the numerical models either too simplistic to capture it or that too demanding computationally, there is no right balance, you know. Uh, perhaps one of the most effective, still computationally demanding model is a large edgy uh, simulation technique, and we use that in our lab. And uh, in the following few slides, I will show you the validation, the rigorous validation we have to do. Uh, I must say, at this stage in computational uh, research, every researcher or every engineer has to show this kind of clear validation to win the trust of uh, engineers, researchers, and uh, the wide insurance industry. You know? Just to do that, what we decided to do was we picked a widely uh, used building, the Texas Tech building. Uh, this building is uh, monitored at full scale at the Texas Tech. Uh, it's a field building, and they have instrumented it, and there is a data, full scale data. And NIST contracted uh, the boundary layer wind tunnel laboratory at Western and generated a high quality aerodynamic database. And it is usually referred as NIST database. We also used that data. And we, one to one, we are trying to reproduce 
the wind tunnel data. And so the first step will be just to generate the incoming flow, uh, just similar to what we see in the wind tunnel. And that's what you see on the screen. On the left is a target wind tunnel uh, test setup. On the right, it is our virtual wind tunnel through our CFD model. And after millions of uh, grid cell generation and uh, uh, perhaps a couple of seconds, in the order of 10 seconds or more, uh, you, you, you were able to resolve the turbulence structure inside the wind tunnel. And at the end of uh, this diagram, just close to the test section, we are going to keep the time history wind field and use it as a boundary condition for our CFD. So this is like a precursor, you know. This, this is just to produce the inflow condition. You can see the, the role the spires are playing in generating at the turbulence at a higher level. And although you cannot see within the flow with the turbulence structure, but the ground blocks that you see on the top were responsible for the turbulence that was generated close to the ground, you know. That's how we do it in uh, the real wind tunnel and in the virtual wind tunnel. Numerically, it, that's what was happening. Then we validated the wind field at every step. First, we started with a mean profile. This is a top left corner plot. Uh, the vertical axis is the height and the horizontal axis is the velocity, the normalized velocity magnitude. And the blue is a wind profile uh, from the NIST database. Again, that is a bound layer wind tunnel test uh, data that is done for NIST. And also another PhD, former PhD student of uh, Dr. Kopp at Western has uh, reproduced the same data uh, and had IV measurements and things like that. Just to show the repeatability, we also included that is a rectangular block. You know? So what you see from this is uh, the red one, which is a numerical uh, velocity profile, is matching very well with the two wind tunnel test. And in the lower part, we have indicated uh, the turbulence intensity, which is the indicator of uh, the fluctuating uh, flow. It is basically the RMS of uh, the flow normalized by the mean uh, velocity. We have to reproduce that as well. Uh, and as you can see, there is a very good match between the wind tunnel and the CFD. It's not enough. We generated the velocity, the three direction velocity at the indicated height, the dark time history plots at the wind tunnel, the, the middle three top plots. And the first black plot is the wind velocity along the, along the wind direction. Uh, the second one is a lateral, and the third one is a vertical uh, fluctuation. The lateral, the fluctuation, the longitudinal, they are fluctua fluctuating at zero mean, but the main wind in the main wind direction, as you can see, there is a mean component, and of course, in the mean, the wind also fluctuates. You know? Then we we monitored uh, the velocity on the same location in our virtual wind tunnel and you see the red plot uh, the three red plots on the bottom and visual comparison tells us they are matching they look like similar you know uh, we generated the spectra for each of the direction the, the spectra along the wind direction the lateral direction and the vertical direction the three spectra uh, then there's a good match between the wind tunnel and uh, what we were able to adduce, uh, produce in the numerical modeling. This kind of asserts that we were able to produce the inflow or the incoming wind, step one. Then we, we went ahead and used this time history as a boundary condition for our building simulation, and we generated the pressure. Uh, the gray box you see here is a schematic of the Texas Tech building that was tested in the wind tunnel. And for the wind direction indicated, we just took pressure uh, points uh, scattered or aligned on the uh, line here. P1 is on the windward wall, 
P2 is on the roof, but on the leading edge side. And P star is in the middle of the roof and P3 is on the downside of the roof. P4 is on the leeward wall. Then we generated the pressure coefficient. Pressure, basically we measure the pressure and we normalize it by half rho V reference square. V reference is nothing but the velocity at the roof building height. That's how we usually communicate pressure and dimensional pressure indicator, you know, pressure coefficient. And the six, uh, sorry, the five plots on the left, the dark ones are from the wind tunnel. And for each of them, we produced or we generated or we monitored the time history from the computational model. And as you can see from qualitative measurement, we were able to produce the time history. As a wind engineer would know, you know, for example, on the roof, uh, sorry, on the windward, the top uh, plots, it is a mean, uh, it has a, a positive mean and eccentricity or the RMS, uh, so the fluctuation both above the mean and below the mean are kind of balanced, you know, but on the roof, it is skewed towards negative. Uh, that's the second row time history. Uh, that's a typical uh, leading edge roof plot. And as you go downstream, uh, the flow kind of reattaches and it goes back, somehow goes back to uh, the Gaussian type of uh, process. And that's what you see, you know, like that trend that we usually would like to see as a wind engineer is captured by this. And not only that, we did a detailed spectral comparison for each of the pressure point and there is a good comparison, you know. Then, we can fairly say, you know, there is a good agreement, you know, decent agreement between uh, the experimental uh, and the computational data. Of course, the ultimate comparison is on the load itself, the pressure coefficients, more specifically the peak pressure coefficient. The peak comprises the mean and it has also the RMS part. Uh, the first plot shows the mean CP, uh, over ABCD line, which is shown on the top right uh, box, AB being the, uh, the windward wall, BC being the roof, and CD being the leeward wall. You know, uh, as you can see, we were able to reproduce the mean pressure and the RMS. And of course, if you produce RMS and the mean, then the peak uh, will be reproduced as well. So. Uh, honestly, from my experience, this is the best agreement we have seen. It is just applying, you know, the care that we do in the wind tunnel to produce a useful aerodynamic data. If you carry over that in the computational uh, arena, I think you should be able to produce uh, useful engineering data. And this beautiful picture, one of my students produced, shows the transient nature of uh, the pressure acting on the surface of the building, generated by the CFD model. Once we validated our model, uh, I'm not going to talk about any validation anymore. We just started applying it to a different case, you know. The case study we brought here is a community in uh, Florida. We picked it because it is being monitored as part of the Florida Coastal Monitoring Program. I would like to acknowledge, you know, the generous uh, uh, support that was extended by Dr. Kopp, who did the wind tunnel testing of this, uh, particularly the one in the building in the middle and some other buildings in the neighborhood uh, as a part of uh, NSF funded uh, project for University of Florida and the Florida Coastal Monitoring Program uh, for sharing their data. And, uh, we reproduce uh, the neighborhood and run a neighborhood scale CFD modeling. And what you see on the graph uh, is a pressure, uh, instantaneous pressure distribution on the roof. You know, when it comes to residential building, we are primarily interested on determining the roof pressure. If it is tall building, we'll be interested on the lateral loading. You know, for uh, most residential building, we are interested on the roof. That is a place where you see maximum load and that is where usually damage initiates, you know. Uh, mind you, in wind tunnel, usually we do it building by building, just simply by the sheer volume of pressure tap that would have been required to 
capture all this, you know. Because of that most loss model, they stay away from using wind tunnel that are building by building, but most likely the development of this kind of computational approach that can be useful at a neighborhood scale, and we can apply neighborhood by neighborhood, could alleviate the accuracy of those loss model. Because as opposed to tying it only to the wind, now the damage or the risk can be tied with the pressure, which is a lot almost close to the damage, you know? So this is something interesting. If you zoom into the middle building, this looks like uh, the pressure uh, distribution on the roof. It is a box uh, in the area of the building. Perhaps one of my favorite animation is the following, you know? Uh, as you can see, the CFD is able to explain the bluff body aerodynamics clearly, you know. You see how the transient wind is coming and interacting with uh, uh, an object which we call bluff body, characterized by so many sharp corners. And particularly, I would like to pay you to drive your attention to the ridge here. You see as the wind interacts with the first ridge, the flow separates and you have a circulation, the dark color here, and that produces a suction, you know. The flow accelerates beyond this area, producing a, a low pressure zone. That's why you see high suction zone, you know, indicated by the red, you know. By the way, just in order to show a reasonable contour, we cropped the numbers at minus 0.2. But as you have seen in the earlier um, uh, peak plot, it, it could peak up to minus 4. Just if you try to stretch it up to minus 4, you wouldn't see reasonable contour. So I just want to make uh, that clear. You know? So when you have this kind of uh, uh, communication or visual uh, means both to teach aerodynamics, to explain the mechanism of the pressure formation, and even to uh, teach the public uh, as part of the uh, preparedness, it, will, it is a useful tool in addition to generating scientific data. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to delve a little bit into uh, the aerodynamics, you know. Most of the time, uh, when we study the wind load or the aerodynamic forces, we study based on intact loads. Uh, of course, we determine the external pressure using intact uh, buildings. And on a separate uh, study, we study internal pressure and we try to estimate the net pressure, which is good as far as the exterior surface of the building design, it's, it has been working. But once something is breached on the, the building envelope, for example, in the second uh, column, you see the plan and the elevation view after a damage to windward uh, window. And the, the aerodynamics as is indicated by the airflow is different from the intact, the one on the left. You know? And this will produce different type of aerodynamics internally, and particularly uh, the load pass on residential buildings is not clearly known, you know. Even when you have the slightest breakage like this, the load participation by the partition walls and things like that alters. And we don't, we don't have those kind of information usually from the typical uh, wind studies that separates internal pressure from the external pressure. Uh, but in CFD, by tying it with building information modeling, we are trying to model the different progressive uh, aerodynamics as it relates to different damage level. Then, if you know from the beginning, from the inception of the damage to small damage to more damage, all the progressive load uh, pattern, then the first step in developing a damage mitigation is to understand how a structure fails. You know? So this uh, uh, computational approach could be useful to unravel this type of information. In fact, we took one example and we hypothetically damage a window uh, just to bring you up to speed. Uh, the study building is shown on the left side as it is uh, indicated in the computational domain and the floor, uh, typical floor plan is shown. It has four elevation four floors, the ground, the first, the third, and the top floor. And whenever you see uh, a, a light blue color, uh, there was a damage as it is indicated by uh, a red square. 
then if there is a damage, the wind can access to the internal uh, space and there will be a flow there. You know? So you have C0, no damage, C1, uh, slight damage on uh, one window, and it goes on as C2 and C3. And the CFD simulation corresponding to the three configurations is shown on the right column as uh, the first row is corresponding to C0 for the elevation uh, and the plan uh, flow field. And the second row is for C1. As you can see, there was a window breaching and there is a wind flow. And of course, once you have a wind flow like this, you know, let's say you have a rain, then it is the wind that takes the rain inside the building, then you can easily estimate the wind driven rain, you know. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in, in sustainable de building design, the same thing goes with the thermal comfort and things like that, you know. But here we are focusing primarily on wind load. And for C2, you have more damage and more airflow inside the building, then definitely this will change the aerodynamics uh, inside the building. And the wind exposed surfaces are not only the external now. The partition walls that we typically do not design uh, for load could be exposed, you know, aggravating the, uh, the continuous the cascading breakage of a house, you know. So if we are trying to avoid uh, damage, we have to look into this load participation as well. Of course, by the time there is significant breakage on the building in the, in the rain would have uh, damaged the internal content, maybe. Uh, the enough indicator, but the more we understand the cascading failure mechanisms and the corresponding loading, uh, the better mitigation we can develop. In fact, going back to the Florida building example, the building that we have been studying, uh, we also uh, induced damage on the and isometric on the roof. garage go and uh, uh, the second uh, the garage door I mean the second corresponds the second column corresponds to this damage scenario and we looked also the high pressure gable end zone and was on the lower side of the house and the raised uh, gable end uh, that describes uh, another damage scenario. And we did a CFD simulation just to look into the uh, internal uh, pressure development, uh, the wind field simulation and things like that. And what we did was also we used the scenario and we conducted a wind driven rain simulation. I must admit uh, the hurricane wind speed simulation, it is a high Reynolds flow and it was taking long time. I, we couldn't make it ready for today but we run a typical uh, uh, normal uh, rain distribution uh, flow rate or a low wind speed. And uh, as an indicator to uh, the wind, sorry, the rainfall rate, you know, and these are what we found, you know. In the first case, when the garage door was damaged, as you can see inside the garage, there was a rain. And as you keep damaging, as, as more, uh, building envelope is breached, the, the rain, the rain falling rate is increasing, you know, it is almost becoming the same as the flow rate, uh, the, the rain rate, you know. In fact, in few cases, more uh, red because the wind is uh, directing it to uh, inside the building. So in this manner, uh, we can really mechanistically determine the flow rate the wind driven flow rate. This will lead to internal, more accurate internal content damage uh, prediction and things like that. Okay, with this, I will conclude the hurricane example. And I will start the tornado uh, example. Here, uh, we'll uh, talk about the numerical uh, simulation of tornado like wind field. And uh, our, the way we develop a generic, generic numerical tornado model that kind of reproduce whatever we see in different tornado experimental facilities. And once we develop that generic numerical tornado model, 
we used it to study uh, an individual uh, and story rectangular building and we tested the WinDE test and compared our numerical with WinDE. Once we develop a level of confidence, we use that model to assess uh, that modeling approach, not necessarily that particular model, as a the modeling approach to assess uh, community-wide assessment by taking the Dead Robin Tornado touchdown case. Uh, tornado, unlike uh, straight line wind, it is a very complex uh, uh, rotating vortex flow and primarily uh, we characterize it uh, uh, by uh, uh, ranking vortex for example if you take a ring a horizontal rank, uh, a horizontal ring which is shown at the top uh, you will see at the place called uh, core radius you have the maximum tangential velocity and it follows kind of ranking vortex model and it dies away from the core radius and it builds up up to the core radius. And vertically, if you see uh, the one with a lots of arrow, it's a vertical tornado profile. Mind you, if you were, if you recall the velocity profile for hurricane earlier, it starts from zero and gradually increases until it reaches a gradient height and it becomes constant. But with tornado, the highest Velocity is close to the ground where the residential building, most of the constructed structures are located, thus inducing more severe damage on top of its uh, high magnitude intense. Luckily, the size of the tornado is small compared to hurricane. And you have also uh, a pressure deficit, which is shown by the red plot here. You have significant uh, suction at the center of the tornado. And close to the ground, the core radius is defined by uh, the point where the pressure drop is half the intensity. And when we produce tornado, we characterize it by the inflow uh, depth, which is shown by H naught. And uh, the updraft radius R naught. And we try to uh, match the geometric uh, similarity described by a aspect ratio, the ratio of H naught and R naught. And the kinematic similarity by square ratio, a parameter that indicates the strengths of the tangential or the uh, revolved uh, rotational strengths of the flow with uh, the upper draft or the radial flow. And the other similarity that we don't respect because we cannot simply do it is a Reynolds uh, simulation. Luckily, uh, as, as long as you pass a certain range, uh, uh, values are useful. So what we did was we examined how uh, different uh, engineering experimental tornado simulators are uh, generating tornado. Uh, we picked the three most popular by no means. These are not the only ones. There are other tornado simulators like the Ferb simulator, the Tokyo University simulator, but we picked the Texas Vortec, the Iowa State University Tornado simulator and the Wind E simulator. I must do justice here. The uh, Wind E uh, simulator compared to the others, it is a very large facility. Just face to face, the wall distance is 25, while the entire tornado simulator here at, uh, at Iowa State is five meters wide. So sometimes uh, the volume of the wind field that you produce and how it fully engulfs the study building is an important parameter. And also, when you scale wind field, that the size is important. And wind is perhaps one of the state-of-the-art facility we have out there. You know? But nevertheless, we looked in detail the three wind facilities. And one thing we quickly understood was, you know, the flow structure of the tornado vis-a-vis -vis the physical dimensions of uh, the simulator uh, Sometimes they talk to each other. For example, for Texas Tech, since it is guided by walls, the inflow depths, which is the, the dimension of the inflow physically, the one meter, it matches with the inflow depths that the tornado it produces. But for Iowa State, the inflow is here, which is bigger, but the, the 
tornado structure in flow is smaller, so they don't talk to each other. You know, at the beginning we were wondering how they were relating. So to resolve that issue, what we did was we decided to simulate the whatever we see in the lab. You know, we produce the vortex the same way we produced uh, the wind tunnel earlier. We reproduce the vortex, the tornado simulator, uh, simulator at Iowa State in the wind e dome and. Whenever I use the word full CFD simulator, uh, that's what I meant. You know, we reproduce every aspect of the facility. In the second, once we study the flow structure, we reduce that tornado simulator, and the one on the left side is a simplified tornado simulator. Uh, of course, we validated our full CFD simulator, the one in the left column, uh, the vortex first uh, row, the tornado simulator at Iowa State, the second row, and the wind E, the third row. And the second column shows a comparison between the pressure field between Texas Tech experiment and full scale CFD. The second, the tangential velocity uh, variation for different uh, configuration, fan one, fan two configuration between uh, Iowa State Tornado Simulator and the full CFD. And the third one is between Windy Dome and the CF, the full CFD. Uh, the, the comparison was good, we were comfortable, and we went on producing our simplified CFD model. To be honest, we don't need the guide vein, the fans to be modeled in the numerical models. We can represent, represent them with simple boundary conditions. So we we simplified the numerical model, but we wanted to make sure the simplified CFD reproduces the kind of wind field that we need or we have seen in the full CFD simulation. And the third column comparison shows between the simplified CFD and the full CFD. Once we develop uh, the confidence on the wind field simulation between the numerical and the experimental, we went ahead and conducted two tests uh, for a 10-story building, rectangular building, one using stationary tornado case, because it's easier to compare with a CFD, and the other translating tornado case. You know, you see it on the left and on the right. And just for sake of time, I will go quickly. And we also reproduced uh, the same thing using CFD and compared it with WinDE. Again, the pressure when the tornado is located at the building at the core, core center coinciding with the location of the building, the first row. And when the tornado is located at the core radius, the second row, uh, the comparisons were uh, reasonable. We also looked at the impact of topography on tornadic field, typically in uh, uh, straight wind. You know, the, the speed up is defined as the increase in velocity due to the presence of hill, the red one is increased compared to the upwind, uh, which is a blue shown on the left side. And that increase in wind speed will increase the wind load in, on any structure located on the top of a hill. Uh, likewise, we developed a mechanism to assess tornado uh, flow speed up effect. But this time what we did was we compared the tornado located uh, in tornado vis-a-vis -vis a tornado located on flat ground, and we compared the, the speed up or the difference in uh, the velocity. The first row shows the radial velocity, the, the second row shows the tangential velocity, the third, the vertical velocity. In all, you can see the, the peaks, uh, the flow was peaking compared to the flat, you know. Those, Chains in magnitude are the speed up, you know. In this manner, if there's a tornado in your, your building, you can estimate it. The last case study is the Don Robin tornado. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the Northern Tornado Project, NTP, led by Greg Hopp at Western, and David uh, joined us from Environment Canada as well. He's the executive director. They gave us this post damage assessment in addition to the other information we collected from the community that live in Don Robin. I would like to, to acknowledge the community. They were very brave, even in their uh, uh, time of uh, sorrow. They opened their door and they 
really share the information, their experience, just to push uh, the knowledge uh, of Tornado, hence contributing the resiliency uh, effort that we are doing. And this diagram shows uh, the Don Robin, the, hot, the hardest hit uh, community before and after the damage. What we did was uh, uh, from Environment Canada and uh, the Northern Tornado Project, we kind of got the estimate. It was EF3 rated between this Pedos C range. And we took aspect ratio. Uh, usually, the range in nature is 0 0.1, 0 0.9. We went uh, halfway and tick 0.5. And we looked at different video and the damage pattern. For example, if you have a laminar narrow tornado like this, uh, a lower square ratio of 0.3 may have reproduced it. But the Don Robin tornado looks like multi vortex wide tornado, maybe a square ratio of uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.6 would have reproduced it. It's a parametric study that we did just to match uh, the damage pattern we saw. And finally, this kind of multi cell tornado uh, was decided to represent, was selected as representing Don Robin. And we went through reproducing the uh, before damage geometry uh, carefully. And uh, we did a tornado simulation. This one is a stationary tornado simulation. Uh, just when it was passing uh, the, on top of the community, and the bottom one shows the pressure. As you can see, the hot spots are captured. For example, this house here, I don't know if you can see the mouse was completely damaged and now we know why you know you see the red spots here and this garage is, was also fully damaged you know and the next step was uh, i must admit we had a high quality simulation but we were not able to generate high quality video so we have to reduce the grid cell and generate some animation but the pressure we produced is from the high quality data we just took a prop and we generated the Tornado. So with this, I could say we were able to uh, match, sorry, to produce a tornado that looks like the Don Robin tornado and pass it over the community to explain some of uh, the damage. And, and in addition, this is my last topic, but not the list. Uh, you know, the beauty of computational models, you know, compared to experimental, they give you information on a con continuous space, you know, like for example, you produce a wind field. Uh, these are like the wind field uh, contour lines and stream lines for different EF tornado for the size of a tornado usually described very well by US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You know? Then if you have different source of windborne debris like uh, compact representing rocks, uh, sheathing and roads, then we know their flight velocity as it is stable here, you know. Then when you have the wind field, you can see, uh, for example, EF3, it will pick even the most difficult one to be picked, you know, the timber sheet, you know. Majority of the wind field will pick it off, you know. So uh, this kind of uh, availability of wind field can, can guide with the wind boundary risk as well, you know. With this, I will complete uh, my uh, presentation by acknowledging uh, my current research team. Uh, I must say, if I didn't have a, a talented group of young people, many of them actually, uh, both from Canada and internationally, that is there due to their hard work day and night uh, working on community resiliency, and all my former graduate students, postdocs, visiting scholars, and the current collaborators in different <laughs> universities in Canada and around the world, and the funding agencies like the NSERC, Canada Research Program, Discovery, CFI, CRD, Ontario Center of Excellence, SOSIP, and the industry supporters. For example, FM Global supported the uh, hurricane simulation I presented uh, at the innovation. IBM and SOSIP support the tornado simulation, and Wasu Tile, Tixton are, uh, are continuous supporter, and of course, not last, but uh, the, uh, the boundary layer wind tunnel laboratory uh, uh, engineers, the wind researchers, 
and we are blessed to have a great group at the West End, the Wind Research Group. And my former group at FIU and the group at UF, I would like to acknowledge them. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions, comments, feedbacks, please, uh, this is the time. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Bitswamlak, for the presentation. That was, that was great. We had a number of questions come in while you were uh, doing your presentation, so I'll begin. But if there are any more questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box uh, now. Uh, so the first question comes from Suzanne, and she asks, are there any studies which specifically address, in this context, retrofitting or other measures to make existing buildings more resilient? Uh, yes. Uh, by the way, uh, the retrofitting, the mitigation, and the estimation of uh, the load, they go hand in hand. You know? In my presentation, I focused uh, primarily on estimating the stressor itself. Uh, but both uh, within my team and other, other uh, members in our team uh, and other researchers around the world, they are continuously developing mitigation, you know. Recently, in fact, as a byproduct of the research work that was uh, conducted over the years at uh, the Sri Little Peak, uh, a whole uh, a community was, uh, is under construction, a new community that are using the mitigation, you know, like the hurricane clip, the tornado clip, and things like that, you know. So, uh, yes, there are efforts out there. And I can also indicate some literature materials uh, down the road. Okay, great. Uh, the next one comes from Ziad. Um, and it's, uh, the question is, LES is by no means universal and requires careful tuning with respect to the geometry and type of flow. How is this handled in your group? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, to even... Uh, support this uh, assertion uh, more. I would say computational wind uh, simulation is not about even uh, the CFD itself. It is about how well you know the wind engineering. Right? It is a physics, you know. So uh, basically, in uh, the approach we took was uh, both in terms of uh, the size of the grid, uh, the the LES type that we use, uh, the duration of the time and things like that, we are carefully examining and going back to the wind tunnel and measuring the wind flow. And we are using our wind engineering knowledge to guide the simulation. As in any numerical model, first and foremost, you have to be a good wind engineer. In fact, honestly speaking, I didn't advocate uh, the CFD as much as I, I, I should and my team knows about it because I'm so much worried about, you know, like uh, uh, a cookie cutter type of uh, use, you know, there's a lot of complexity uh, in wind engineering, computational wind engineering. Uh, so one has to really follow the same kind of care that we follow in the wind tunnel test, you know. I will give you one example. If you invite someone who is not uh, experienced in the wind tunnel use and send him in the wind tunnel and produce CP, trust me, the first couple of uh, measurements they do, it will be garbage, you know, uh, because someone has to know the wind engineering even to run the uh, wind tunnel properly. Likewise, uh, here we are using it with caveat. For example, most of our wind load evaluation, they model uh, the wind tunnel scale, not the full scale. The only simulation in the hurricane modeling, when we do the wind rain, we, we didn't have any choice except to switch to full scale modeling. Uh, that's why we are struggling with a high roads number flow issue. So it is our uh, wind engineering knowledge that is guiding the large area simulation in short. Okay, great. And the next is um, a comment and question from Dan. It's Dr. Bitswamlak, thank you for your interesting presentation. I totally agree with your recommendation regarding the need for detailed validation of CFD tools. 
To that end, I was wondering if the digital data from the wind tunnel experiments of the Texas Tech Building, which you conducted, are available to the community. There are many different CFD methods and solvers used by different teams around the world, and I think they would all benefit from high-quality data of relatively simple structures. Uh, yes. If uh, this question is pertaining to the digital data of the wind tunnel to validate, yes, it is available. In fact, we intentionally used a publicly available data. Uh, it is available in the NIST database. Uh, if, if someone types on Google, uh, Google uh, search NIST uh, database, you can uh, get it. And our data, the CFD simulation, will be also available. Uh, I'm going through revamping uh, our research team uh, uh, site. In fact, one of the pledge we made for NSERC and our funding agency is to make the data available. So uh, to answer uh, more concretely, the wind tunnel data that we use for, from NIST is already available, and the CFD data that we produced will be available. Okay, great. Um, and then the next two questions are both um, relating to, I believe it was slide 26 when you're talking about wind-driven rain. Yes. Um, and they want to know how you simulated the rain in the numerical analysis. Uh, what numerical method did you use? How did you simulate the interaction of the rain with the wind? Uh, for example, did you simulate the raindrops explicitly or was there a simplified approach? Okay. Uh, the wind-driven rain uh, was simulated uh, at full scan. Uh, we use uh, uh, large eddy simulation again, but as you can see uh, from the information, uh, we used a very low wind speed, three meter per second, and we started our simulation by simulating a normal rain flow, not tropical rain flow. It's just like we poured one millimeter rain uh, it's an approximate uh, Eulerian approach that we followed. Uh, we did not uh, explicitly model it. We just use a multi-phase flow Eulerian approach. Okay, great. Um, and how did you simulate the tornado in the CFD analysis? Um, was that a boundary condition applied at a specific boundary or a combination of boundaries or an initial velocity pressure condition specifically applied to the nodes of the computational domain? Okay, thank you. Uh, we use... Just let me go to the... Mm -hmm. Sorry, I missed it one second. As you can see from uh, uh, the right figure on the pressure, uh, sorry, in page 30, uh, we use the velocity inlet here. And of course, the R0 and H0 uh, are determined. You know, that's what uh, I mentioned as aspect ratio. And uh, we know. For example, uh, what kind of HU, uh, H0 we, we have to use. By the way, there is a paper by uh, Anand Gairola and myself uh, that shows all these details that we see here. Then uh, you have shear free wall on this walls. The one, I don't know if you could see the cursor here. Then you have a pressure outlet on the top, you know. And when you use this kind of setup, it will generate the tornado. So basically, we are controlling it through this boundary conditions. So of course, the square ratio decides uh, the intensity of uh, the tangential degree over the radial. You know, so once we decide a square ratio of 0.7, for example, and with uh, the H not R not ratio of 0.5 we were able the stationary tornado that we 
I showed earlier for Dar Rodan. For the translating tornado, we make it larger because we have to move the neighborhood at the base. And the way we translated the tornado at this point in time is just we made the tornado stationary and we moved the neighborhood from the base uh, through morphing grids. Uh, then, then, of course, at the end of the day, we mimic the translating tornado. This is the same as, you know, like in the vehicle uh, dynamics. It is a car that is moving, but when you study vehicle aerodynamics, you, you make the car stationary and you apply the wind, that kind of approach. Okay, great. And then this will be our last question. Um, so it comes from Eamon and they ask, thanks, or they say, thanks for the excellent presentation. My question is, this type of simulation with high resolution, how can insurance companies make use of it for risk assessment on both community level and component level? Uh, in fact, this is an excellent uh, question. You know, like uh, what we foresee in the future is perhaps the insurance industry would relate the risk with a lot as opposed to only relating it with uh, the velocity at different level, at the component level, at the building level, uh, and most importantly, uh, we are interested uh, uh, community laws as well, you know. Uh, mind you, there is a perception, you know, because buildings are built by individuals, and the probability of, for example, tornado hitting a particular house is low. Uh, yes, this may be a convincing sentence, but when you look at the probability of a tornado hitting a city, it is more, you know. As far as the committee is concerned, it is not, it is not uh, the specific house that is hit, but any house that is hit is important, you know. Uh, from a hurricane perspective, we can, we can uh, model a big swath of uh, community and produce uh, accurate uh, wind load, and we can tie the risk with this type of high resolution data. In the future, we also plan to combine it with uh, structural uh, models and we can, uh, time and computational resource permitting, we can go up to the damage level as well. So in this, uh, in this manner, when there is no claim data or when there is more resolution and accuracy is required, this type of approach could augment uh, the, uh, the risk modeling uh, process. Thank you. That's great. Uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Bitswamlak, for the presentation. And thank pleasure. you to everybody. Yeah, and thank you so much to everybody that tuned in today. Um, keep your eyes peeled for our next Friday forum uh, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.